This is our final video diving into the custom graphics development of the Callisto protocol. In this video, the processing of the visuals above will be explained using a single frame and its various GPU draw events. These are the settings we used for the capture, so let's go right ahead. The first portion starts off with render target clears and the usual Unreal Engine compute shader bloat taking up about 0.6 milliseconds. Next, a full prepass is initiated, but luckily there isn't too much problematic geometry, so it only ends up costing 0.35 milliseconds. If we take a closer look at the prepass with an alternative view mode, we can select short, wide draws to see which ones had the best cost to final pixel contribution ratio. Some of these are pretty dense, but because we're only rendering geometry depth with no textures, a specialized hardware path is used to write pixel depth without invoking any pixel shaders. The only draws that use pixel shaders are the last five, which are also the most expensive. This is because their final depth requires opacity textures, and this is combined with their extremely dense quad overdraw inducing geometry. A copy resource is initiated for a buffer used at the end of the pipeline for the main display output. Even though ray tracing was turned off, two RT structures are processed followed by a few small compute shaders. Low poly geometry are used as occlusion queries to be quickly compared with the current frame's depth to determine if certain objects or lights need to be culled, followed by a 48 microsecond high Z creation. Three render targets are used for Unreal's decal systems, taking about 0.1 millisecond. The deferred base pass processing is completed in 2.1 milliseconds. While the majority of these draws send outputs to seven render targets, these orange draws output extra information to five more render targets that hold Realis information. Realis is used on eyebrows, eyes, and the face, which cost the most because it writes the highest amount of Realis pixels. And the face outputs to a sixth render target containing dual normals, which was another custom implementation made to GGX to correctly render sweat. The beard and hair inefficiencies detected in the prepass are now multiplied by the complexity of the base pass outputs and additional PBR texture inputs. Now that we've covered the main outliers, we need to determine if one millisecond makes sense for the scene complexity. Most of the cost comes from pixel shading, and the efficiency of pixel shading depends on the arithmetic complexity, texture counts per materials, and compression schemes. 90% of the time, pixel shading is never bottlenecked or bound by material logic slash arithmetic complexity. They're usually more texture bound and these two aspects are the main things we can observe in the pipeline. Now we've measured the general threat interactive compression scheme with overly dense geometry on the same 3060 at 1080p. If we compare this base pass wireframe with that context, I would say the scene is about 0.3 milliseconds slower than it should be. But we have to account for the fact that static objects also use high resolution BC3 and BC7 light maps. BC7s are just as costly as unpacked grayscale textures, which we'll cover more in depth in a future video. But if we take a look at the most efficiently drawn mesh and analyze the textures, we can find five textures rather than the standard three PBR textures because the artists make use of tiled material masks. Now this workflow needs to be investigated in terms of performance viability, but there are definite problems that we can point out in this game. The normal and one of the tiled albedo textures are very high resolution despite little variation in detail. It's also surprising to see two masks. The bigger problem with these masks is that they're using BC3 compression, which have nearly uncompressed alpha channels. It would be a very reasonable limitation for artists if they were limited to BC1 textures with cheaper 1-bit alpha channels, especially when these masks have simple and literally empty channels that could easily occupy such a limited channel type. The artist also extensively used cheap vertex painting for extra material effects, a technique that rendering systems like Nanite could not support. There's probably a lot of potential in this workflow, but in the end everything is shaded with Unreal's Lambert GGX BRDF, which means nothing outside of basic roughness, colors, and unique normal patterns get expressed. Not providing artists with a BRDF with basic implicit behaviors is a slap in the face to artists' efforts, and players in the end are stuck with easily forgettable visuals that the brain will aesthetically reject regardless of art style because of quantifiably inaccurate behaviors. Initial draws are always quite poor, but it's hard to say how much of this relates to poorly compressed masks, high-resolution tiles, or light maps. This messy, unoptimized last draw near the end, though, shows a valuable lesson. It uses three PBR textures, but also several oddly compressed tileable textures. It's important to understand that if mistakes like these exist in one area, it tends to occur in other levels and game. During the base pass, the character draws also create a stencil inside the depth buffer. This is copied into another buffer so the depth stencil channel can be used for later processes. Decals are rendered into the main lightmap buffer created during the base pass, taking 60 microseconds. 
Eight shadow maps with the last frame's shadow information are cleared, followed by a sequence of small compute shaders that take 0.2 milliseconds. 0.1 milliseconds is used to draw static shadows in a 1024 squared resolution shadow map. By simply looking at this shadow, we can easily deduce that the artists were not trained to disable shadow casting on floor meshes. This is a fundamental optimization for shadow maps that would have halved the cost of the shadow if implemented. The static shadow map information is copied to another same sized buffer where dynamic shadows like the character is rendered on top. On higher settings, this shadow map copy gets extremely costly, to the point where rendering the character on a separate shadow map would only be a third of the copying cost. The mini conclusion here being, at all cost, never copy high resolution shadows. Six more 1024 squared resolution shadow maps are used to render dynamic objects and the character five more times for the various lights determined visible in the scene. Those 30 to 18 microsecond outliers of course relate to the unoptimized hair meshes. Small tessellated draws and compute shaders process some volumetric fog data at a 0.27 millisecond cost. The scene lighting is processed in this portion. And this is a bloated mess, but it's very easy to understand if we break down the draws. There are 9 lights that are visible in the scene and take 1.2 milliseconds to shade. The draws before each light relate to two different operations. 40 of these draws use the scene depth to project to different shadow maps on a shadow mask, which are then used in those 9 lighting draws. Now it makes a little sense that these are split up because they need to go back and forth between projecting the static atlas shadow map and then projecting the retrospective dynamic shadow map. But if we pretended each light had a static shadow map and a dynamic shadow map, that would only require 18 draws. It would only require 9 shadow masking draws if those dynamic shadows were rendered on a larger atlas also containing the static cast geometry. But 40 shadow masking draws are used because the masking is broken up by 146 stenciling draws. Now some of these stencils make a lot of sense, and the ones that make sense are actually the cheapest. For instance, the first stencil is simply a structure that represents the maximum range of a light. A custom engine modification was made for this game to optimize how many pixels on screen evaluate non-moving lights. In Unreal, if we put a light behind a wall, not only will its occlusion query fail, causing shadows to possibly redraw instead of being cached, but the GPU will waste time evaluating the light for pixels within that boundary even if it's shadowed. The bait maximum boundary will not only make occlusion queries more accurate, but the rendering boundary of the stencil can minimize the amount of pixels the GPU evaluates lighting for, as we can see with the first lighting draw. As the diffuse lighting and specular buffers are lit, the stencil area is also efficiently cleared simultaneously with lighting to free up the stencil for the next light operations that need it. This stencil can also minimize the amount of pixels have shadow masking evaluated as we can see with a last light or an order of shading, Light 9's shadow mask. But Light 9 uses the character stencil saved earlier in the pipeline, so it ends up evaluating way too many irrelevant pixels for lighting and the shadow mask. The rest of the stencil draws also leaked tons of performance, going back and forth from rendering light bound stencils to full re rendered stencils of dynamics like the door to separate shadow masking from dynamic and static geometry, causing all these shadow masking breakups. The entire character was re-rendered 5 times for its stencil, taking up 0.7 milliseconds, while other dynamic objects like the door meshes and the constant stencil clears take up another 0.74 milliseconds, even though these stencils were created during or saved right after the base pass. Because these complex stencils are used for shadow masking and ignore the bounds of the retrospective lights, all this overlapping shadow masking work is done by the GPU for a light bound that could potentially be barely visible on screen as we can observe with Light 5. The standalone light stencils would be pretty fast by themselves and could potentially run faster and provide better lighting performance if the bounds had a little more vertices to achieve a tighter fit around static geometry, as this would help scenarios like Light 3, where many pixels are evaluated but only contributes to a small portion of the scene due to local shadowing. Tessellated effect draws and compute shader half resolution subsurface scattering is completed in 0.23 microseconds. Using all the relevant G buffers and lighting buffers created during the base pass and 9 lighting draws, the lit buffer is produced in 0.1 millisecond. Then a fairly noisy SSR is processed in 0.1 milliseconds, which is combined with local cube maps to provide the scene with speculate data at a 0.36 millisecond cost. Fog is shaded in 0.1 millisecond, followed by 0.26 milliseconds worth of particle effect processing. Then a modified version of Unreal's incompetent TA is processed in 0.32 milliseconds. Further post processing is completed in 0.24 millisecond cost, followed by color grading and tone mapping, which also takes 0.24 milliseconds to process. The developers did not use Unreal Engine 4's bland ASUS 1 tone mapper for this game. 
they specifically implemented the GT Tone Mapper to convey better realism. This Tone Mapper is the predecessor to the GT7 Tone Mapper we explored in our 19th video. This is why the Unreal Engine look is slightly less apparent in some areas of the game. The Tone Map frame is processed, copied, and sent to the display in 0.17 milliseconds. Everything here adds up to an 11.56 millisecond budget, which easily falls within range of the median in-game performance. Now a lot of performance could be gained if these aspects were more optimized. Several well performing games we've analyzed on this channel have shown much cleaner uses of compute cheaters, and this kind of blow is specific to stock UE4 slash UE5. Optimistically, these compute cheaters shouldn't even exist, but this chart shows a pessimistic evaluation. Unreal 4 to 5's graphical pipeline is very dependent on a full prepass, and the reduced cost simply simulates a prepass without any alpha testing or tiny objects, which can easily be skipped based on screen space size values. Removing Realis provides a huge performance boost without much change in the image, and the hair timing was replaced with a timing that aligns with previous hair rendering attempts discussed in previous videos. The base pass timing is pretty self-explanatory. Optimistically, I think that scene could easily take 0.60 milliseconds. Copying the static map was wasteful, so this cost accounts for skipping that step and removing the floor draws. The lighting would be faster with slightly better stencils, and optimistically, I think the light balance stencil cost would be lowered too, because less pixels would be written even though more vertices would be used. The dynamic stencils are a huge waste, especially when those stencils already existed in the pipeline. With conservative stencils and one shadow atlas, the shadow masking cost would be way lower. The timing for the shadow mask here is the product of multiplying the cost of the slowest shadow masking draw in the pipeline by the number of lights. In comparison with other engines, the ending draws are clearly bloated, so this chart reduces that significantly to resemble better engines. All these changes would allow for a huge budget for many different scenarios or visual features that 9th gen adjacent hardware could support. Thank you for watching this analysis and to those who support these videos and their research on Patreon. Supporting our Patreon allows us to study technical engine faults and helps us get important conclusions out there in the public. Successful content creation is how we intend to reach a financial surplus that will fund the development of our game, which will lead to the development of an easily accessible Unreal Engine fork containing the various innovations we cover on this channel. Thank you for all your support.